that, everyone. I'm Sandy Lucas, the Program Manager for the Climate Variability and Predictability at Program at <laughs> Climate Variability and Predictability Program at NOAA. Thank you for joining us for this webinar series called Years of Maritime Continent and Piston Field Campaign. This is a continuation of a series of webinars for the CDP program that started several years ago. Today's webinars are being recorded and will be available from the CPO website under the Climate Variability and Predictability section. If you've missed any of the prior talks in the past CDP webinars, I encourage you to view them from our website. All sessions from this series are now posted there. The Years of Maritime Continent is an ongoing set of international field campaigns and modeling efforts focused on the Maritime Continent region. YMC is led by the countries of Japan, Indonesia, and the U.S. in partnership with several others. Of particular interest to NOAA and the Climate Variability and Predictability Program is to improve understanding of processes that affect the propagation of interseasonal oscillations, such as MJO and the maritime continent and its broader region. MJO is important to local weather and climate, as well as having global teleconnections. However, the maritime continent region can sometimes act as a barrier to the propagation of MJO, and weather and climate models have a hard time reproducing this effect. In response to that need, the CVP program solicited for observation and modeling projects that investigate different processes that affect the MJO. Additionally, in collaboration with the Office of Naval Research, CVP supported several activities of the Piston Field Campaign. This year's webinar series covers the 16 projects funded by CVP. With three sessions left, we are coming towards the end of this webinar series. I'd like to ask that you uh, do a save the date for April 8th at 4 p.m. in Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, and those in between, which uh, is our regular meeting time. So that date is April 8th. On that day, I'd like to have an open roundtable discussion about the current state of this research and what gaps remain. I think this is an exciting opportunity for everyone to give input openly. This meeting will be led by Chidong Zhang, and I welcome input from all of you, including those not directly funded by CVP. So just to repeat, please save the date on your calendar for April 8th at 4 p.m. Eastern. More information on this will follow in March. Additionally, one last piece of housekeeping as we come towards the end of the series is that if there's interest in continuing this YMC webinar series as a community-led effort beyond March, please contact me and Victoria Breeze to volunteer to organize future speakers and dates. I may have speakers already lined up for April 22nd, so your duties, if you should volunteer, would begin in mid-April. Again, please contact us at the email addresses that are shown on this slide. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Victoria Breeze for our communication specialist for her continued support during this webinar series. Victoria will be describing the series and introducing the speakers today. Victoria, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Sandy, and hello, everyone, and welcome to the eighth of 10 webinar sessions, not including our uh, wrap-up session afterwards, on the topic of years of maritime continent which will feature two presentations per session and will run from September 10th, 2020 to March 25th, 2021. The series of presentations will share the latest results from these projects and will allow PIs to discuss the importance of their work, outcomes, and lessons learned with a broader scientific community. We hope you will enjoy today's talks and ask plenty of questions. As you listen to today's presentations, if you have a question you would like to ask the presenter, please raise your hand. Raise your hand is a feature which you can find on the control panel for GoToWebinar. At the end of the presentation, I will unmute those who have raised their hand so that they can ask their question using audio. If you have audio problems, I will ask you to please type your question into the questions box, which can also be found on your control panel. Our first speaker today is Dr. Wei Ching Shi. Wei Ching is currently a postdoc fellow at the International Pacific Research Center and a research affiliate in the Oceanography Department at the University of Hawaii. After receiving her bachelor's degree in atmospheric science from National Taiwan University, Wei Ching got her master's degree in earth sciences at the Georgia Institute of Technology and finished her PhD in oceanography at Texas a and University in 2018. Her main research interests are air-sea interaction and model biases in tropical simulations. Wei Ching, thank you so much for joining us. 
At this time, we will turn the controls over. It looks good. Okay. Um, aloha, everyone. Um, before I start, I would like to thank uh, my PI, Kelvin, for giving me this opportunity to talk about our research. I also want to thank um, our collaborators, Anna, Yan Li, and Kazu at the IPRC. Um, so based on previous studies, uh, people have shown that the ocean response is very crucial for MJLs. So using, uh, compared to using atmospheric only model, um, using the a couple model will give us a better simulation of MJLs. So this suggests that the ocean response or ocean process is very important when we simulate MJLs. So in this uh, study, we'll be using an ocean-only model to look at how um, the simulation of MJL-related response are. So in order to do that, we will need two different things. First is we need a um, suitable forcing. So we need a data set that can capture the survey fields that are associated with the MGLs. And we also need a good model that has sufficient horizontal and vertical resolutions. In order to get a suitable forcings, we have been looked at three different root analysis, which are GIA55, GIA Intrim, and GIA5. And to identify um, the MGL event days, we use the bimodal intrasystinal oscillation index. And we compare the three root analysis to different observational data sets, depending on which variables we're looking at. And the period to look at are basically from uh, 1979 to 2016. So the, <clears throat> excuse me. So the top figures are showing um, both the extending EOF one and two of the winter OLR in the tropics. So um, combining the two EOFs, we're looking at half of a MGL cycle. So from here, we're looking at the signal propagating from the Eastern Indian Ocean all the way to Western Pacific Ocean. And to, to um, look at the typical MGL signal, um, here we multiply all the values by one standard deviation of the corresponding PCs. So here, um, we only plot out the results for uh, oscillation and the GRA55 because both of the ERA data sets has uh, really uh, similar to oscillational uh, values. So by looking at um, the values here, we can tell that the GRA55 is underestimating uh, the signal throughout the half cycle we are looking at. So um, here we also plot out the MGO phase composites um, of the intrasystinal OLR. And the three regions we're looking at are the Eastern Indian Ocean, the Maritime Continent, and the Western Pacific Ocean. And the lines here we're looking at are um, oscillational values showing in uh, black, and YARI5 in red, YARI entering in blue, and YARI5 in light blue. So in all the three regions, we can tell that the GRA55 is way underestimating uh, the values throughout all the A phases in all the three regions. And uh, if we look at the two ERA uh, data sets, then they are more comparable, and also the values are closer to the observation. So because of this, we'll be focusing on only the two ERA uh, data sets. The top figure here is, um, are showing basically the, the same composites, but now we're looking at the intrasystinal precipitation composites. The um, black line here is still the oscillation, while the red line here is ERA5, and light blue line here uh, is ERA interim. So in all the three regions we're looking at, both of the real analysis underestimates the value also throughout the A phases, and it's especially in the Western Pacific Ocean, both of the ERA data sets are not getting uh, the peak here around phase seven. And if we only compare the two ERA data sets, then ERA five is doing slightly better than ERA interim in all the three regions. And the bottom figures are showing the PDF of the intrasystinal precipitation. So now we are looking at all the intrasystinal uh, signal not just 
the MGO days. So um, from the Eastern Indian Ocean here, eastward to the Western Pacific Ocean, we can see that the extreme events in both wet and dry decrease quite a bit from uh, west to east. So we're seeing more of the extreme days in Eastern Indian Ocean compared to the other two. And if we compare the real analysis to the Australian, then we can see that both of the ERA data sets underestimate um, the extreme, extreme days in both wet and dry events. So um, if we compare just the two um, ERA data sets, then ERA 5 is still doing better uh, than ERA interim, especially in the Eastern Indian Ocean. So we have looked at other var variables as well, but we found out that the largest difference between um, the two reanalysis and among the reanalysis to observation is in precipitation. So here we only show the precipitation results. Um, so we will be using these two uh, ERA reanalysis to force a model and look at our simulation of the ocean response. The model we choose to use was the ocean only part of the MIT GCM. And the region we're looking at is in this black box, which covers from the central Eastern Indian Ocean to Maritime Continent and Western Pacific Ocean. And the way we generated our initial and lateral boundary conditions uh, was we first did a 40-year uh, spin yard run, and then we used that to run a larger domain, which is this domain, lower resolution run, and then with downscales to the region and the resolution we need for our runs. So we did four different runs using both EI interim and EI phase uh, as four scenes. So uh, the first run we have is the ERA interim daily force run in which we force with uh, daily variables plus the six hourly uh, 10 meter wind because uh, this is the highest available resolu uh, temporal resolution we have from ERA interim. And the second run is the ERA five daily runs in which we also use uh, daily variables, but we use the hourly uh, 10 meter winds. And we did two different hourly runs, um, which are the hourly and hourly stars runs, in which we both use hourly variables from ERA5, but we increase the top 10 mirror vertical resolution for the star run. So in all of these uh, four runs, we use one ninth of a degree as the horizontal resolution. And uh, for the top three runs, we have 187 layers totally, uh, vertically, and then um, the resolution is decreasing uh, from around three meters at the top uh, to the bottom. And then for this uh, star run, uh, we actually increase the top 10 meter uh, from three meter resolution to 1.5 meter resolution. And for all the four runs, uh, we ran for four years from 2009 to uh, start of 2013. Uh, and then we threw out the first year as being up and then left uh, three years for analysis, and all the outputs were saved uh, in daily means. So by, by comparing these four runs, uh, we're looking at how different factors, such as the atmospheric fields, the forcing temporal resolution, and upper ocean vertical resolution can influence our simulation in the uh, MGR related ocean response. So here we are looking at the three year means and intrasystal variability of the service variables. So the top figure here is showing the sea service salinity three-year means in control and intrasystal variability standard deviation shading. So uh, looking at the three-year means, uh, we can tell that the uh, ERI entering daily force run and the hourly star runs are having fresher top layer compared to the others. But if we compare the ERA5 daily runs to the ERA5 hourly runs, then um, there's no much of a difference between the two in either th uh, three-year means or intrasystem variability. So this suggests that the temporal resolution of the atmospheric forcing is not that influential um, to our simulation of the color uh, salinity. And if we look at the SST patterns, 
uh, compared with the salinity, we don't see much of the difference among for uh, four runs. And if we look at the mixture depths, it's uh, quite obvious that the largest differences is in the uh, difference between the yeah, uh, I mean the daily runs and the hourly runs. So this might suggest that not getting the diurnal cycle of the uh, survey fluxes can end up having us uh, have the errors in the intrasystemal variability of mixture depths, especially in the eastern Indian Ocean. But uh, we need to do more study to uh, to conclude uh, this this uh, relationship. Um, so the figure I just show you are all showing the intrasystemal variability, which may include uh, both the MGO and other factors such as the ocean processes. So here we're looking at the MGO phase uh, composite to better link the uh, intrasystemal variability to MGO itself. So the four uh, boxes we're looking at are the Central Indian Ocean, the Eastern Indian Ocean, the Maritime Continent, and the Western Pacific Ocean. So the lines here um, are showing the surface salinity in red, uh, SSC in blue, and MSP in gray. So Guanado 2014 has suggested that if E minus P is the only controlling factor that influences the uh, surface salinity uh, fluctuation, then we should be seeing a quadratural difference between the two. So for example, if we have a sine waveform for the E minus P here on the right, we should be seeing a cosine waveform for S prime here. So in terms of the MGO phase, that means we should be seeing a two phase of lag of uh, surface salinity to the E minus P. So we only see this in the central Indian Ocean, uh, suggesting that the E minus P is very influential in this region. But if we look at the eastern Indian Ocean or the maritime continent region, then the surface salinity uh, in red is actually in phase with E minus P, which is in gray. So this suggests that the ocean process should be also as important in these two regions. And if we move on to look at the Western Pacific Ocean, then we don't really see a positive correlation if uh, SST is uh, lacking MSP. So this might suggest that the MSP is not as important in this region. So the, the figure on the right is showing the maximum correlation lag phase of the surface salinity to E minus P. So uh, from Central Indian Ocean, we can see that the uh, SSS is lacking E minus P for two phase, and then it decreased to uh, zero phase or even no uh, correlation. And to better uh, compare the differences among the forens. Now we're looking at the maritime continent phase composites between the EIA interim daily run and EIA 5 daily run. So the largest difference we can see is in the uh, red line, which is showing the uh, service salinity variability. So using the uh, equation of state, we can uh, estimate the contribution of change in uh, surface temperature as well as the surface salinity to the change of the surface uh, density. So based on this, we also see the uh, contribution from the salinity much larger in the EIA interim daily run compared to EIA five daily run. And um, also, if we just look at the uh, salinity versus the temperature, then the salinity contribution is much larger, uh, especially in the EIA interim daily run. So this uh, relationship can also be seen in the Eastern Indian Ocean between the early and the early star run in which we increase the top 10 meter uh, vertical resolution. So if we compare the blue lines, uh, which is showing the SST variability, then we don't really see any differences between these two run. But if we look at the uh, red line, which is showing the salinity here, then there's pretty uh, a very large differences uh, 
especially in the peak phases. So we can see that the early star run is having much larger availability compared to the early run. And this can also be seen um, in the contribution from the service salinity to the uh, service density. So we wonder why this kind of large uh, differences between the salinity not feeding back to any large differences in SST. So we plot out the uh, up ocean uh, profiles for temperature, salinity, and density in the region. So the solid lines here are showing the results from the early run, while the dashed lines here are showing the results from the um, early star run. So increasing the top 10 meter vertical resolution actually gives us a fresher top layers here, and it doesn't really change the temperature too much. So this uh, fresher top layers also give us a drop in the density uh, in the top layers. And this change also induced in a, a shallower mixture of depths in the star end, and also a shallower isothermal depths uh, in the star end. So if we calculate the barrier layer thickness, which is the difference between these two, then we actually see a decrease in barrier layer thickness, which shouldn't be a case if we look at the density profile here, uh, because we are seeing more of uh, a stratification in the middle layer. So here I use another index called the cooling inhibition index, in which uh, we calculate the potential energy that we need to homogeneous mix up uh, to a certain depth to have the service temperature drop by a certain degree. And here I use 0.5 as the threshold, but depending on different MGO events, it can range from 0.2 all the way to more than one degree Celsius. So if we look at this index, then we actually see an increase in index, suggesting that it's uh, harder to mix up the layer and harder to have this uh, surface temperature to drop. And um, here I want to uh, point out that the change in the mixture and the isothermal depths are both very small. So the definition of mixture depths can strongly influence our results of the barrier layer thickness. So this suggests that we should pay uh, more attention when we use this kind of index. Um, so the change of density uh, might uh, be an explanation why we're not seeing the strong difference uh, of salinity between the runs feeding back to uh, SST difference uh, between the runs. So in summary, um, the intrasystal variability of the precipitation in ERA-5 is closer to the observation, uh, even though both of them still underestimate the variability of uh, precipitation. And the maritime continent has a similar service uh, salinity to temperature to E minus P relationship to that of the extent in the ocean, suggesting uh, both precipitation and the ocean processes can be very important in the region. And we also show that the bo uh, both the atmospheric forcing and the upper ocean resolution of the model can impact our simulation um, in change of upper ocean salinity. However, uh, this freshness of these uh, surface and near surface layers can suppress the impact of the differences in uh, intracentral salinity on the intracentral variability of SSC. So that's all I have, and I'm ha happy to take any question you might have. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Wei Ching. Uh, anyone who has questions, please raise your hand and we'll get you unmuted. Uh, Daehyun, I see your hand raised. I've unmuted your audio. You may have to do the same on your side. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah, this is Tehan Kim from University of Washington. A uh, very mm -hmm. nice talk. Uh, can you go back to the SST interseasonal variability map? Uh, give me a moment. Uh, do you mean this one? Yes. Uh -huh. So yeah, interseasonal 
uh, variability standard deviation is in shading so uh, in all formats uh, I see it's not a minimum but interseasonal variability of SST is much lower uh, in the eastern Indian or equatorial Indian Ocean uh, just to the west of uh, Sumatra compared to the south of it and if I remember correctly, if we look at uh, intraseasonal variability of precipitation, for example, I would expect a greater intraseasonal variability near the equator than uh, in the uh, like 10 degrees south or something uh, near that. So mm -hmm. do you have any insights about the discrepancy between the two variables? Um, I, I don't think I have a really good explanation but one of the possible uh, reasons that we're seeing larger variability like in the north and in the south by coming from um, the uh, lateral boundary condition we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we, we cut off our boundaries um, around the region I'm showing here. Mm. So I guess we, we should look into that. Okay, I mean, do you happen to know like uh, how total SST variability look like? Or, I, yeah, I wonder if you look at, for example, like high frequency SST variability uh, periods of shorter than 10 days, for example, I wonder what would it look like? Um, I haven't looked at that, but it's a good suggestion. Yeah. I will do a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the hands back to Zhang. You should be unmuted on your side. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, I'm very interested in to, um, to the results of the phase relationship between uh, surface salinity and uh, temperature. Can you go to that slice? Uh, yeah, exactly this one. So mm -hmm. um, what is striking me is um, the box uh, over Java Sea, uh, west of uh, Borneo, and that's uh, red. And to the east and the west is all yellow. So make that location very special. Do you have any explanation of that? Uh, right. Um, so in this region, I think one of the possible reasons is we don't have enough uh, ocean points in the box. Because I, I did like a composite for each like box instead of using uh, each grid point to do this calculation. So I, I guess I will need to check the, uh, the significance of the uh, correlation in the region to have a better idea. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Right. Not seeing any more hands up in chat. So Wei Ching, thank you again so much for your presentation. Thank you. And we will switch over now. So uh, up next is a presentation by Dr. Robert Bob Joyce. Bob graduated from Florida State University in 1989 with a Master's of Science in Meteorology. He worked with Noah's Nesdis from 1989 to 91 in the evaluation of Ceres slash ERB-E uh, instrument designs and has worked with Noah's INSEP Climate Prediction Center, the CPC, since 1991. Uh, around 1998 and 99, he developed uh, CPC's four kilometer, 30 minute global merged geostationary satellite IR product. And again, during 2001, 2003, uh, developed the eight kilometer, 30 minute passive microwave based combined satellite precipitation estimation technique, CPC morphing, AKA CMORPH. Bob is currently part of an energetic and innovative team refining refining the second generation pole-to-pole -pole CMORF precipitation estimation algorithm. Bob, thank you so much for joining us. At this time, we're gonna get the controls turned over to you. Okay. Okay. 
the title of our presentation today, um, Seamwork Detected Precipitation Diurnal Cycle of the YMC Domain. Uh, the, uh, the, the lead author here is my supervisor, Ping Ping Z. Uh, he's uh, organized our group to work in um, very different uh, focuses for the, uh, this project, as well as he organized the, this presentation as well. And I thank him very much for that. Uh, my associates, Li Ren and Shrong Wu, made major contributions to this presentation. And they will be noted on the bottom of, of, of various slides here. And of course, we thank uh, Shidong Zhang for providing the BMKG uh, gauge reports, which were very important for this, this project here. Okay, so the, the focal points for our project. Uh, number one, providing Seamorph and other associated satellite data uh, for the YMC program. Uh, next is to verify the Seamorph satellite precip estimates over the YMC domain with gauge uh, measurements and other ground observations, uh, as you'll see, uh, the ship radar uh, precipitation estimates collected by the YMC program. Next, we will uh, we'll show documentation of the mean climatology and the diurnal cycle of precip over the YMC domain as observed by Seamorph and the gauge reports. And lastly, we want to show some, uh, some uh, really neat uh, things that are going on, improving the raw Seamorph satellite precipitation estimates, especially in detection and quantification of orographic rainfall. Uh, next slide. Okay. Okay, the Seamorph uh, algorithm, it's, it was uh, developed here at CPC about 20 years ago. And uh, the, at the time, there were a lot of different algorithms going on, how to combine, the best way to combine uh, the satellites to get S, uh, the best product. We took a very different approach in which we used all the available passive microwave uh, precipitation estimates instantaneously from every satellite that had the, uh, the either the sounder or the imager, passive microwave imager, we took advantage of that to get the most accurate estimate, instantaneous estimates. And then we used the geostationary satellite IR imagery to derive cloud motion vectors, but they were further uh, refined by actual radar precipitation motion to propagate this passive microwave imagery, both forward and backward in time. And then of course, the final product was a morphing of both the forward and the backward propagation of the, the, the high quality um, uh, passive microwave precipitation estimates. And you see a, a few references uh, here. Um, the specifics of the data set itself, nominal resolution, eight kilometers, is global, 60 north, 60 south, with a temporal resolution of 30 minutes. And this data set is available. The full archive begins in January of 1998. It's updated in near real time at a latency of two hours. And we also have extreme precipitation climatology uh, of the Seamorph at the 99, 95, and 90% tiles, the mean and percentage of the rainy days. And you cannot see the FTP site where all of this is, but you'll see it a little bit later on. Uh, currently, Seamorph is used by the WMO to monitor precipitation extremes over Southeast Asia. In the middle uh, of the, uh, the middle three panels right here, just sort of examples of Seamorph in different ways. The top one, it's just a, a weekly uh, accumulation of Seamorph uh, ending in the middle of this month. Uh, the middle being the anomalies for, for that period. And the bottom is just a percentage of what would be the, the normal for that one week ending on the 14th uh, of February of this month here. The upper right panel here is a standardized precipitation index uh, for a 30 day period. Uh, of the Seamorph estimates ending uh, again at the uh, February 4, uh, 14th, the middle of, of this month here. Uh, next slide, Victoria. Next slide, yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, what we've provided for the YMC program, um, the Seamorph estimates we provided at the nominal resolution, uh, maybe a slightly expanded domain for the YMC at 80 east to 160 east, 15 south to 15 north. Uh, 
at the nominal temporal resolution of 30 minutes, and the intensities are uh, millimeters per hour. Uh, this began on the 1st of October of 2017. It's currently updated on a near real-time basis, latency of one hour, and the latencies of two to seven hours are also continuously updated. So if any additional satellite information is coming in, those products are being uh, updated all the way up to seven hours uh, in near real time. So the historical record of Seymour uh, is available upon request, anyone can request it. And now you can see the FTP site. These data files are available uh, on the following data site for the YMC domain. And also you can get two different animations. We're looking at one right now. This is the most recent 48 hours of, uh, over the YMC domain. And this temporal resolution is at 30 minutes. Uh, so we're in, in, in this eight kilometers. There's also an additional animation, which has a little bit longer record. It's, it's, it's out to seven days. And, uh, the temporal resolution is one hour. So it's uh, a, 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 little, a little bit bigger in the temporal um, resolution, but you, I think you get the same, uh, same kind of pictures of what you see with this animation right here. Victoria, can I, next slide. Next slide, Victoria. Okay. Okay. We really want to thank Shadong Zhang. Uh, he was the one who arranged the, the gauge reports that we got from the BMKG uh, of Indonesia, uh, both three hourly gauge reports and also hourly reports. The three hourly reports we got were for 164 stations. And that record, 18 month record, went from January of 2017 to June of 2018. In addition, we got hourly reports from a subset of those stations, 95 stations, a longer period from January 2017 through July of 2019. So the first thing that we did was an inner comparison of the two data sets for that 18 month overlap period. And we've what we found was very interesting. For some of the stations, we had almost a perfect correlation of some, some higher than 0.95 when we lag, when we did a temporal lag of the local time hourly reports with the synoptic time three hourly reports. Uh, for some stations, we got great agreement. For others, we did not get very good agreement. When we saw the disagreement, it was very clear that the three hourly reports were agreeing more with the satellite-based CMORF estimates relative to the hourly. In fact, by using, well, well, I'll get to that later. So we first used the three hourly station reports that agreed very well with the hourly stations to come up with 39 uh, high correlating uh, hourly stations. And you see those, I don't know how well you can see this in this panel here, they're little red squares. These are the locations over, over the YMC domain. Uh, where these 39 stations are and they had high correlations uh, can i go back yeah yeah okay uh so in addition to using the three hourly ports which agree very much better with the seamor than the aggregated three hourly temporally matched we also use the three hourly uh reports to do a qc so when we fitted the hourly with the three hourly reports when they both uh indicated precipitation we use the hourly. When they both indicated zero precipitation, we use the hourly. When they disagreed, one had precipitation, the other one did not, we use the three hourly uh, reports to screen the hourly reports. Okay, Victoria, next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> sorry, there's a bit of delay, okay. but it's going. Thanks. Yeah, sorry about that. I'll, I, I'll get ready for the delay. Uh, this is a um, scatter density plot between the aggregated hourly BMKG on the x-axis and the three hourly CMORF on the y-axis, you see some agreement. However, there, there are definitely differences. Uh, for one, right away, you do not see a lot of three hourly CMORF accumulations greater than th uh, 30 millimeters for that three hour period, whereas you do for the aggregated hourly BMKG uh, you, right, right, or, you know, you look at that, that about 30 millimeters uh, for that, that three hourly period. The correlation is 
not that great, it's 0.37. And over other regions such as CONUS with MRMS, we've seen a much higher correlation. This is again, just the raw seamorph, no gauge corrections or anything. We've seen those correlations right around the order of about 0.6. Other thing that we did was we wanted to look at what was the best spatial resolution of the Seamorph uh, precipitation retrievals to match with the gauge locations. We looked at the nominal A kilometer, we looked at quarter degree, and we looked at half degree. The highest skill that we found resolution in the Seamorph was at quarter degree. The other thing that we noted, the performance of the Seamorph degraded in, in regions of uh, you know, substantial or graphic effects. Okay, uh, next slide, uh, Victoria. So here what we did, we took a look at the uh, diurnal cycle by both the hourly gauge, which is in red, and the seamorph, which is in blue, by the local time on the x-axis, okay? And, and we did it by season, DJF, and, and the other seasons. And what we noticed was the peak pretty much was always really close to around 15 local time, as denoted both by uh, the gauge, the hourly gauge, and the seamorph in the blue. Uh, between 15, maybe a little bit later, uh, 15 towards 18 for, for both data sets. In a similar fashion, we also noticed that both showed the minimum between local time three and six for both data sets. And here's where some differences came in. Uh, during the minimal part of the diurnal cycle, the total amount of precipitation from the Seymour from the blue line was fairly close to the, the hourly gauge, where we saw the big differences right at the peak of the diurnal cycle. We're noting only about half. We're, the, 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 the satellite estimates are getting about half, and, and, and you can see that's pretty consistent from season to season. Right, right. The, the thing that was obvious, we were getting the phase pretty well every season with the satellite estimates relative to the hourly gauge. We weren't capturing the, the peak of the diurnal cycle. The other thing that was quite interesting between the comparison of these two data sets, if you notice, when you hit the peak uh, with the Seymour, there's a slower degradation uh, uh, going towards local midnight on the right side of each panel. With the hourly gauge, you saw quite a, 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 a quick drop, and, it's, and that's more realistic. And the, the thought here is that probably, you know, the hydrometeors and the clouds were still being uh, scattering the, the passive microwave, and we're still getting some instantaneous passive microwave estimates that were relatively too high as, as the, the diurnal cycle for the day was, was, was dying off but, but in the, the satellite. So, so these are obviously weaknesses in tropical uh, precipitation as determined from uh, the passive microwave. Next slide, Victoria. So we also looked at um, sub-regional, uh, the, the diurnal cycle uh, sub-regional sections here. And in this case, what we're, we're taking a look at uh, Sumatra, we're, we're specifically looking at the northeast coast of Sumatra, this five stations here, hourly stations that had high, high quality control uh, agreement with the three hourly, five stations here, and we're looking at DGF for 2017, 2018. And we're looking at the southwest coast of Sumatra. There were four stations here also for DGF uh, 2020. 17, 2018. We saw, see some real big differences. The Seamorph and the gauge for uh, DGF Northeast Coast of Sumatra started seeing a diurnal cycle peak right at about 15 local time. And that kind of carried on through the day almost until local midnight uh, with both, both data sets actually. Uh, just before local midnight, the, uh, the gauge, you know, still increasing the Seamorph kind of hold an even rate here. Seamorph did not really underestimate that badly over the northeast coast of Sumatra. But if we go down to the southwest coast of Sumatra, we do see something quite different. We see a peak in the hourly gauge right around between 18 and 21 local time. Uh, 
and we see a really sharp drop with the gauge. It really ends things pretty quick. Whereas the Seamorph really underestimating the peak of the Darnell cycle on the southwest coast of Sumatra, uh, kind of flat, all the way from that, you know, sort of 1800 uh, local time till uh, local midnight. So very different between the two different coasts. Okay, Victoria, next, next slide. We also looked at the shipborne radar precipitation comparison against Seamorph. In this case here, the radar uh, aboard the ship investigator uh, cruised the Australian coast between the middle of September and the end of December of 2019. And if you can see it, there's a little red line along the northwest coast of Australia. That's the track of the ship right there. And you can see, if you look interior of the coast, you can see some, uh, this is the mean uh, seamwork precipitation for that period. You really see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, precipitation as indicated by the satellite rainfall. And what we, what Ping Ping found is like for really large events, and he, and he depicted a really nice one down here in the bottom two panels, the Seymour from the bottom left agreeing fairly well with the, 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 the ship radar precipitation uh, on the bottom center uh, uh, part of the, the, uh, uh, the slide. But the quality of both the precipitation from Seymour and the ship radar was found to be compromised over regions of uh, complex uh, topography. And right now our, our group is, we're working on the, uh, the reliability of both the, the radar and the Seamorph uh, over this, uh, this, this Northwest uh, coastal region of uh, Australia right now. So Victoria, next, uh, next slide. Okay, these three panels here, we're, we're, we're looking at a spatial depiction of the diurnal cycle of Seamorph over the maritime continent. Uh, the first one here is just, we're just looking, uh, this is just, just mean, you know, millimeters per day, and, and you, you can really kind of see, not just over the, the, the land regions of the maritime continent, uh, the, the high uh, precipitation, but also the adjacent oceans. Uh, and the, and the, the rates here are uh, millimeters per day. Here we're looking at uh, a period of 14 years, longer than the, the, the maritime, uh, years of maritime uh, continent, 2006 to 2019, and this is for DJF. The middle panel here is a real good indication of what the diurnal cycle differences are between land and ocean. Here we're doing a standard deviation of the hourly Seymour from the mean, and you see really big differences over the, uh, the land regions, uh, and that, that just indicates how large the diurnal cycle is over the, uh, the land. The bottom panel is kind of interesting here because we're looking at the time of the maximum precipitation of the diurnal cycle, and this is a universal time. And you look at the, the land regions and they're all indicating basically about the same time. And you see a very, very gradual transition of that diurnal cycle as you go into the, uh, uh, the, 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 the oceans, right offshore from the, from the man uh, from the land uh, to, to look at that transition a whole lot better the very next slide is an animation of the diurnal cycle over the maritime uh, continent here and uh, it's, 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 it's quite interesting you you look at the buildup in the early local um, afternoon over the land areas and you just see that uh, maximum just propagating offshore into the local oceans. There are some really neat features if you look at this closely. If you, you look off the, co the, the coast of Sumatra and Java, you see a big uh, area that just propagating slowly eastward uh, over the adjacent oceans. So it's, kind of, it's kind of fun to watch the slide a, a little bit here. Uh, Victoria, if you can go to the next slide. So what we did, we, we looked at Sumatra a little closer. Uh, and what we tried to do is we wanted to focus on the diurnal cycle in a cross section that was centered over the spine of the mountains uh, uh, over the island. And we, we averaged this over uh, five and a half south to five and a half north. And this cross section was composite relative to the, 
the mountain ridge, which you see in the bottom panel over uh, a thousand uh, meters here, which is the middle of each one of these panels here, um, is adjusted for each degree of latitude. And so you, you, you see some very interesting things here, right? The, the Darnell Peak, right in the middle of the, of the, the ridge, starting right around one uh, local time in the afternoon. Uh, and of course, it's kind of peaking right around three, but the propagation of this precip is very different depending on which coast you're looking at. If you look at the, the coast to the, uh, the western coast, which is on the left part of the panel, you see a much quicker propagation of the precipitation into the, uh, the adjacent ocean. If you look to the, uh, the right of the, the, the mountain ridge, which is the right side of the panel, you see a much slower propagation. But what's quite interesting, if you, if you go up to the very, and the, the y-axis is local time, if you go up to the very, uh, you know, early morning of the uh, uh, early morning hours, where you see the absolute minimum of precipitation over the spine of the ridge of the mountains, you look to the adjacent ocean and you're almost seeing the exact maximum. So it's, it's, it's almost a uh, pretty close offset. Uh, and that's pretty, pretty interesting to look at. Uh, next slide, um, Victoria. So what we also did here was looked at the diurnal amplitude of precipitation for the eight phases of the MGO again for DJF and again for this 14-year uh, period uh, in the Seamorph data set. And we, we, we've noticed that two phases, uh, phase two really had the, the maximum diurnal cycle. Uh, if you notice both the east uh, and, and west uh, of, the, of the mountain range for phase two, strong convection uh, on both sides of, those, uh, uh, of that ridge. If you go down to the, the, the suppressed phase, which would be uh, five and six, you look at five, a very, very weak uh, convection um, west of the ridge uh, of the mountains there for phase five. Victoria, next slide. So looking at those two individual phases a little bit closer, um, what we notice again, we're superimposing the, the, the Seamorph, uh, again, stratified uh, by local time uh, on the y-axis to the ridge of the mountains, you see in the phase two on the left part, really strong convection on both sides of the ridge of the mountains, but you really don't see propagation uh, of that convection into the ocean. Whereas if you go to the right side of the, uh, the slide, you, you, and there's very weak convection west of the mountains, but uh, to the northeast, uh, to the east of the mountains, you do see some propagation into the, into the oceans for this, uh, uh, for this phase right here. Okay, Victoria, next next slide. Okay, summary and future work. Okay, so as we saw in the beginning of the presentation, the Seamorph didn't have great skill uh, in the hourly and three hourly uh, correlation with the, with the gauge over the maritime continent region uh, compared to other regions such as CONUS with the MRMS, but it did com it did capture the phase of the diurnal cycle uh, pretty well. Uh, albeit the amplitude of the peak got about half of the uh, precipitation. Okay, so throughout the uh, presentation, we did see how strong the diurnal cycle over the maritime continent is. Uh, the peak over the land in the early, uh, no, actually sort of mid towards the late afternoon and for the uh, adjacent oceans in the early morning hours. Uh, so over Sumatra, we saw that the diurnal cycle cycle propagated from the mountain ridges towards the ocean over both the eastern and western slopes, reaching the maximum over the, uh, the, the island in the mid and late afternoon, and then towards the, uh, uh, the early morning hours for the ocean. Over the eastern side, we saw the convection over the ocean developed and then moved back west towards the land and, and converged with the convection coming down from the mountain over the eastern coastal regions. So uh, the last two slides, we saw that the, uh, the amplitude of the uh, diurnal cycle was modulated by the MGO, enhanced for the uh, phases two and three, and suppressed for phases five and six. And lastly, I wanna show some, some really interesting uh, work that we're doing in our, our group here, which is to help quantify the precipitation intensity associated with in regions of, of, of substantial uh, or, or graphic effects. 
And if you look at this, there's three panels here. If you look at the the most uh, the one on the left here, this is the raw seamorph on the x-axis, and you can see a real strong underestimation. And this is over the western coast of the uh, the U.S. Strong underestimation compared to the MRMS uh, radar product, which is the y-axis. Okay, this is the raw with no correction done whatsoever. The middle panel does show improvement. This is just a, a, a PDF, uh, you know, correction to the raw uh, Seymour estimate. So decent increase in correlation and a reduction of the under um, bias uh, quite a bit. But what Ping Ping has been working on lately is uh, inclusion of model-based uh, circulation and vertical profile information with an AI-based uh, technique that shows some results in the far right panel, which are really, really quite encouraging. An increase of correlation of almost 0.1 and almost zero bias uh, left. And again, we're looking at a, an area where satellite precipitation estimation is completely uh, at its worst. And, and we see if you look from the left panel, the raw satellite estimates to the right panel of what uh, Ping Ping's been able to do. Uh, substantial improvement and, and a, a good look for future uh, uh, work. Uh, that's what we have. Great, thank you so much, Bob. That was a wonderful presentation. And thank you for your patience with my internet delay. Uh, uh, yeah, no, it's no problem. All right, if we've got any questions for Bob, please raise your hand in the can chat. Can you uh, also un unmute uh, Ping Ping, uh, Victoria? Yes, Yeah. that is done. Okay. Any questions currently, but as Ping Ping said, you can reach out to them later. And Ping Ping, before we go, I don't know if there's anything you or Bob wanted to add uh, before I do the sign off. Yeah, well, well uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, I think uh, uh, this uh, study demonstrated that we really need to combine the strength of uh, institute measurements and the set of observations to, to get the, uh, the comprehensive picture of uh, uh, the dino cycle and its interaction with, uh, interaction with MGO. And uh, we believe we get something very interesting and we want to continue this. Uh, so that we can uh, uh, we'll understand uh, more about uh, this important topic uh, about the interaction between MDO and DinoCycle over uh, the uh, maritime continental region. Great. Well, thank you both for sharing your work with us today. All right. So again, okay. thank you everyone for joining us today for this set of presentations in our series of Years of Maritime Continent. I would like to thank today's presenters, Wei Ching and Bob, for taking their time to share their work with us. The recording of today's webinar will be available within the next week on our website, cpo.noaa.gov slash cvp slash webinars. Our next webinar will be on March 11th, 2021. We hope to see you all then. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.